So what I wanted to do today was give you a little bit of background information on the Port of Anchorage and what value added that will be to just about any logistics operation that needs to take place to support anything uh, up on the North Slope. It's also an opportunity for, for us to maybe debunk a few myths. Uh, I have found in the almost eight years I've been with the Port of Anchorage that most of the experts on the Port of Anchorage have either never stepped foot on the place or are relying on documents that they read 10 years ago. So time to get you all up to speed so you can factor this, uh, this great facility into your planning when the time is right. So it all started for us uh, when the ribbon cutting happened on just that little piece of dock that you see in the lower, the lower left corner of that uh, picture on the left hand side there in September of 1961. Then along came the 1964 earthquake and the only port left standing in south central Alaska was this little dock at the port of Anchorage. So a lot of what used to go into Seward as a normal course of events began to come up to Anchorage instead and we have since forged long-lasting relationships with what was sea land, what is now Horizon Lines, and, what, and in the mid-70s, uh, we added Totem Ocean Trailer Express. Uh, the petroleum business started with Standard Oil, uh, and that has grown now into having uh, five uh, petroleum tenants down on the port, and uh, one we're gonna add uh, when the groundbreaking for Delta Western's new terminal starts this spring. Uh, why I say this is because this is a protected port from tsunamis. Uh, when the 64 earthquake occurred, all that damage that you see on the right-hand side was mostly tsunami caused. Uh, we were protected from tsunamis, which gave us a little bit more of a probability of, uh, of survival in that area there. And I don't know a lot about science, but the folks that talk about that say that is still the case today. This is a little bit about our anatomy. Uh, I will call your attention to a couple of very important items on this list over here. Uh, first, the last one. Uh, centrally located um, in the hub of the state with close access to road, rail, uh, and water, and air. Anchorage has become the transportation hub for the better part of the, of the south central area of Alaska. We're less than four miles from where all the freight forwarders are and they take the big containers that come off the ship, break that cargo down into smaller groups, either truck it out to all the stores or get it packaged to go out to the airport to get flown on the Ravens and Northern Air Cargos and the like of the world uh, up, to the, uh, up to the rural Alaska region. We've got two miles of rail spur on the port that is connected directly to the Alaska Railroad main line. We're about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile from the railroad central uh, trailer on flat car handling yard, uh, but we also have two miles of, port of uh, rail facility on the port that is quite often used in lieu of trucking everything over uh, to the railroad. So we do a lot of work right on the port. The railroad likes that, and, uh, and we get a lot of benefit out of it too, as do customers uh, when you can keep the cost of goods down. This is a breakdown of what our tonnage looks like uh, on, a, on a regular annual basis. About four million tons of cargo comes across the dock. I call your attention to the two numbers off to the side there. Uh, that four million tons accounts for about 83% uh, of all the containerized cargo that comes into South Central Alaska and about 95% of all the refined petroleum product. Uh, when you look at all kinds of cargo and you glom all that together, how much of it comes through the Port of Anchorage is about 74%. We handle a lot of volume. Uh, and, uh, and we do it well, and I wanted you to kind of store that away in your head because I'm going to talk a little bit about availability on the port, and it's somewhat surprising that we can handle this much stuff um, within this port and still have time for anybody else that wants to come and use it. And those numbers, by the way, came from a McDowell Group study that was, uh, took about four months to do. It was just completed this month, uh, so these are numbers that are hot off the presses. This is what the petroleum infrastructure looks like. Uh, you know, one of the things the LNG, the LNG guys brought to our attention was that you know, there's going to be a lot of fuel needed uh, when they start the construction uh, when they start the construction project, whether it's for trucking or other other kinds of uh, 
things that are going to that are going to consume a whole lot of fuel. When they come to us and they talk to us, they're very interested in how much petroleum infrastructure we have and is there sufficient to handle the volumes that they're predicting they're going to use. Uh, we have currently 2.8 million barrels of storage capacity at the port. I mentioned a little earlier that. Uh, Delta Western is going to break ground this spring on another terminal. They plan to add another 360,000 barrels of storage on, uh, you know, on an eventual basis. And as demand requires them to add the infrastructure, they will be adding the infrastructure. Um, barrels to gallons, 42, 43 gallons to a barrel if you want to do the math and figure out how many gallons we're talking about here. And Crowley is uh, about to add more fuel infrastructure on the terminal they already have down at the port. So that side of our business is growing. Um, with the closure of the, of the Flint Hills refinery, as unfortunate as that was for, the, for the, the folks up in Fairbanks and for Alaska, it has been a boom to our business because the demand didn't go anywhere. The demand was still there. That's not why they shut it down. So that fuel had to come from somewhere. Uh, it's coming from overseas, uh, but we managed the capacity to, uh, to handle that down at the port, we went from what averages two or three uh, petroleum tankers a year to 14 in 2014, and the outlook is for 14 plus in 2015. So fuel is alive and well. And I put this picture up here of these tankers and the winter because one of the big myths I want to debunk is we get ice in the winter time, it doesn't freeze solid. We're open year round. Uh, this is crummy ice because there's a lot of glacial silt in it since uh, Upper Cook Inlet is pretty much glacier river fed and with the tide swings that we have every day, two high tides, two low tides, between 25 and 35 feet depending upon what time of year we're talking about, uh, that water's always moving so brittle ice doesn't freeze uh, and the tugboats can move it out of the way and big ships can just push it out of the way. So we are open year round. Uh, it's never been closed for, for ice since the ribbon was cut in 1961. This requires a little bit of algebra. I won't, uh, I won't ask you to, to take a math test, but suffice to say, um, all of that cargo that we bring into the port, we do with plenty of time left over for just about anybody else that wants to come in. It literally we're busy about 316 days, birthdays a year. Now a birthday is 24 hours in a birth and we have three births. So it's three times 365 to take it, the big number. Uh, we, uh, we occupy our time about 316 of those thousand plus birthdays, which means there's a lot of dock availability time. So if anybody's telling you we're too busy, uh, just go ahead and you know, flush that myth out of your head. We have plenty of time for you. Come on down and, uh, and we'll, we'll make you work. And uh, petroleum docks are the same way. In fact, petroleum docks are a little more available. Uh, these are 2000, the end of 2013 numbers. So when we do it again for 2014, given those tankers we're in, and we usually uh, see a tanker for anywhere between 36 and 48 hours, uh, that number is going to change a little bit. But it's not going to change so substantively that, that, they're, uh, that we're gonna lose an appreciable amount of time of availability on those docks either. So yeah, we have time for you. And this is a little like we, uh, what we look like in the, in the winter time. It's uh, not that much ice buildup on the fendering this year, given we've had more mild weather than we've had uh, cold weather, but that usually is, uh, that's a typical weather, uh, winter weather view. Uh, occasionally ships will come in um, with ice caked on them like that, it's not, it's not Cook Inlet's fault, it's the Gulf of Alaska's fault. Uh, it's a very punishing, uh, unforgiving environment. So, uh, so sometimes a ship will come in with so much ice on it, it takes the longshoremen about uh, seven, eight hours to chip all the ice off. And they literally use sledgehammers to do it to get the ship prepared to, uh, to get, the, get the containers off. Uh, I might as well take that opportunity to give a pat on the back to the longshoremen that work the docks at the Port of Anchorage. Uh, you know, weather doesn't stop them, uh, and they are highly skilled. They've supported the oil and gas industry for 50 plus years. So there's a lot of talent there that comes to bear. And we're also very good at handling what I like to call ugly cargo. That's stuff that doesn't come in boxes and containers 
elegantly packed, nice geometric cubic shapes and that kind of thing. Um, every now and then the business you're in calls for something a little less formed that has to come off a ship. And, um, and here are some good examples. Uh, you know, the top two pictures are uh, the pieces parts for all the wind turbines that went out to Fire Island. Uh, they all came in across the dock, we staged, staged them on the port, and then used our barge dock to uh, load them up and ship them out to Fire Island. It was one of those barges with the, with the nose that drops, so it's a landing craft type thing, and uh, because there's no dock on Fire Island at all. So they had to beach the, continue to beach the barge and drive everything off. So we were able to accommodate that same kind of logistics operation on the, on the Port of Anchorage side as well. So all of those turbines went out there, plus a fair number that went by rail uh, to Healy for a Golden Valley Electrics wind turbine project. And the bottom pictures are, yeah, th those numbers are not wrong. That's no kidding how big these, these generators were that went to the Eklutna power plant uh, up in Eklutna. Uh, there were 10 of them. They all came off, believe it or not, the same ship. Um, and uh, they are about 8 million pounds apiece. And special handling equipment to get them off the dock and a special rail car to take them up to Eklutna one at a time. So uh, it, was a, it was a pretty interesting operation, successfully done. We didn't break the place, we didn't break the generators. So like I said, you know, these guys are, are, are in the business of making this kind of stuff successful and they did a great job. And a, just another recap on the rail on the port. It's two miles of track. Uh, I, like to, you know, I like to point out that our track is a quarter of a mile from our dock and it's at the same elevation. It's not up a you know, 20 or it's not up a six or seven degree slope on an unpaved surface uh, and a two mile drive from where my rail might be. It is a quarter mile paved surface to where the track is. So we add a lot of value there. And we've moved quite a bit of military equipment. That's what you're seeing up there in the upper right-hand corner now. That picture was taken a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the 125 Striker Brigade from Fairbanks, from uh, Fort Wainwright, is uh, redeploying. So all their rolling stock and equipment are coming back. And then we use, uh, you know, like I said, we, uh, we move a lot of cement by gondola car. Comes into the port and, uh, and goes out by rail. Uh, one of the biggest customers for Anchorage Sand and Gravel, that's their facility down at the port, are the mines. I was surprised to find that out. Yeah. Okay. You're going to be early for lunch, unless you have a ton of questions for me, because this is our last slide. This is the kind of what I want to leave you with. We're a pretty project-friendly place. We got time for you, we got space for you, we got skilled labor that knows what the heck they're doing. And uh, all you got to do is, is ring us up and come talk to us, and, we are, and we're happy to help you make your plans successful ones at the best cost for you and your customers. And we're excited about our future, uh, and we don't get patted on the back by too many people, so we take every opportunity we can to pat ourselves on the back. It's a, it's a great place to work. We're having a bunch of fun. You've got a very talented, skilled uh, port staff. Uh, that is dedicated to working on our business, not just in it. So you're getting value for your, uh, for your dollar when you come down and, um, and do business with us. So subliminally, Greg, let's leave this up and I'll, and I'll ask any questions or I'll answer any questions you guys want to ask. Okay, questions. Are good or are you that hungry? <laughs> Sure, um, and, I'll, and, and let me caveat that with the fact that I didn't go there on purpose. I didn't go there on purpose because I can't guarantee the facility is going to look any different tomorrow than it looks today. But I did want to make sure everybody understands with the facility we have now, we have this capability. Uh, when we get the opportunity to, to do a construction project that improves and makes, uh, makes a little bit more modern and makes a little bit more survivable uh, the facility, then what we can provide is going to be even better than what it is now. Uh, where we stand now is uh, we've got all, uh, we're in the permitting process for a lot of the work. 
Now, we've got $130 million in the bank, and we've got a plan for how to expend $130 million to begin the modernization project, not an expansion anymore. It's a modernization now, and it's an expansion because as you saw those numbers on that slide about availability, uh, we've kind of proven that's five years of history uh, of what's been going on at the port. We don't need a bigger port. We got plenty of port. We just need one that's a little bit more modern. So we've downsized it to a modernization project. Uh, the permitting process is underway to to perform the construction that we need to perform. Uh, we're going we're to isolate a couple of, of internal projects that need to get done uh, before we can begin any work on the main dock, but that when we finish them, you get independent utility out of them, and you're not relying on, or you're not worried because you've got something unfinished that something next has to happen for. So once, you know, and we've worked real hard at, at breaking out those initial pieces, parts with the money we have so that we can be successful and get value out of that money that we spend. Uh, and then all we're doing next is standing by um, to figure out how to, how to raise the money for the, for the rest. Uh, you know, nobody's going to be very successful going to the state this year, probably not next year, uh, highly unlikely the year after that. So, you know, Thank God it's not my problem to solve uh, by myself or by or the port staff problem to, to solve uh, by ourselves. Uh, we are part of a team at the municipality that's putting its heads together to look at some other financing options um, and public-private partnerships are not off the table. Uh, we just have to make sure that what we that what we get ourselves into is in the long run good for the municipality and good for the state. So we're putting, our, you know, we're putting our heads together to come up with a smart uh, alternative to relying exclusively on the state to come up with the money. Um, but you know, we don't want to take that off the table uh, completely either. Uh, I think if we get a few successes under our belts uh, for the first time in a long time, then, uh, then we may be able to break loose a little bit of support down in Juneau. Any other uh, questions? Hi. Originally, the project was uh, um, geared around the military deployment around the world, and then um, after moving up, you showed them one of your slides, moving them up to uh, the bottom mm -hmm. of the to different parts of the world. Uh, was the military looking at downsizing, uh, this, the port downsizing, that maybe we're downsizing because the military aspect has been no, that, that, that's, that's a good question because uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to correct a, a misunderstanding there. Uh, the main focus of what was the port expansion project was not to build a bigger port to support the military. You know? uh, and I don't even want to go into the logic that went behind why it was an expansion project before. Our, our dedicated support to the military is now and always will be what the military wants. Uh, and what the military needs. We're a national strategic port, we're one of 23, and we take that mission very seriously. But I will tell you this, the business model for the United States Army has changed dramatically since we were of a mindset where you've got to amass acres and acres and acres of military, uh, military equipment, put a, put a big guard operation around it, and, um, and wait for a big gray bottom military ship to come in to take it all out. Uh, they haven't done that since 2009. And there have been four deployments. What they do now is they've gotten a little bit smarter. They see these container ships that come up here uh, twice a week, uh, going back 80% with containers 80% empty, and they bought space on that. They're all going back to the same place anyhow. So they figured out a way to, the military has figured out how to use commercial transportation infrastructure to accomplish what it is they need to get done. And it's at a lower cost. Uh, and, and also it frees up those very limited uh, naval vessel resources that the, that the military has for other things more mission related. And they don't have to move a lot of stuff around. So the, their business models changed a little bit. Um, they're right in our backyard and connected to us, and they're connected to us by rail. So that whole theory of just-in-time movement of things works just as well for military equipment as it does for, for commercial uh, 
consumables and, and, and the like. And we've just figured out a way to exploit all of that, which means you don't need as much real estate as you might have thought you needed. 